This is the DRF Players Podcast. Hello and welcome to the June 2nd edition of the DRF Players Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Thomas Fornatal. We don't have any Mike Hogan or Jonathan Kinchin today. Both those guys are off doing other things, taking care of important business in their lives. Instead, I'm joined by a very special guest. This is a guest who, were there a Mount Rushmore of handicapping authors, his face would surely be etched upon it. Not only that, some of the players that he's influenced who've gone on to write great handicapping books, like Andy Beyer himself, would be on there. So he's not just uh, a great handicapper, he's a teacher of other great handicappers, an impressive honor. I'm talking about Steve Davidowitz. Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Peter, and that's a very generous introduction, I must say. Uh, there is no Mount Rushmore uh, for <laughs> handicappers, but at the, same, at the same time, you know, I do take pride in the fact that, uh, you know, I've tried to teach through my writings, and I've tried to learn new things so that I could play better, and um, I've written books that I'm proud of, including a new one that just came out. Well, we're going to be spending an awful lot of time talking about that today. Why don't we start off with a quick discussion of the new book, and then we'll loop back to it to talk in detail. It's called Cashing Big on Racing's Biggest Days. Steve, where did the idea for the new book come from? Well, actually, it goes back 20 years, and I included that in the first chapter, and I started thinking about focusing most of my play on the best racing that uh, Americans have to offer, and I was at Woodbine for the Breeders' Cup, the only Breeders' Cup they had there, and uh, I made a pretty good score uh, on a horse that I thought was really over, uh, you know, he was going off an incredibly uh, ridiculous odds, uh, alphabet soup. And I used him as a key and I built a few other, uh, you know, bets around it. And there were there was another bet that was also on that uh, Breeders' Cup. And over the years since, I would find myself focusing more of my play on the biggest racing days. And racing itself has cooperated by scheduling more of their best races on the same days. Like the Kentucky Derby, for instance, uh, it used to be a race that stood by itself, and they would have a couple minor supporting stakes, and you had the Kentucky Oaks the day before. Now you go to the Triple Crown Racing Days, and they've got a minimum of six stakes on the key card and maybe a dozen stakes on the day before and the day of. And when we get to the Belmont this year, there's going to be ten uh, stakes races. And I love it. And I love playing the better courses and linking different types of bets uh, uh, with them. I think it's particularly friendly to a lot of the listeners to the podcast and uh, people who are going to be eventually reading the book because for a lot of fans, they're weekend warriors. They don't have an opportunity to follow what's going on in the fourth at Belmont on a Thursday, but their lives do allow them to focus in on a big weekend day, and that's one of the things I loved about the book. It's very targeted advice to that group of players. Another thing I thought was really cool about the book is, while your own insights and what you share from your own experiences in the book are tremendous, you also reached out to a number of other interesting and a diverse group of handicappers to offer their advice on the topic. I don't mean to make you uh, pick among your, your favorites here, Steve, but is there one piece of advice or one contribution from one of the other handicappers you spoke with for cashing big on racing's biggest days that stands out to you that you think listeners will want to check out? Well, I have to give some thought to that because I, everybody who made the contributions from, and I'll list them, Gary West, who is a Texas-based handicapper, who the, most of the players would be familiar with because he's contributed nationally. Dave Valento is someone that also is based uh, in the Texas area most of the time, but very few people really know, and he's tremendous and offers insights that are different from what Gary did and different what John Preachy did and Steve Christ and uh, John Kinchin, who I think is part of your, your simulcast, your podcast most of indeed, the time. Indeed, indeed. He's usually here uh, sitting in your chair, Steve. Uh, you're actually sitting in for him today. He, folks are well aware of his insights and his belief in how well you can do on racing's biggest days for sure. Not only that, but he's a contest player. 
for the most part and earned his reputation by doing very well in contests. So he has a slightly different perspective. And when those big racing days come and they're part of a contest, he's all over them. And he has a really good group of insights. And Matt Carruthers that you see on TVG, he's a lot better handicapper and thinker than most of the public probably knows. He does his role on the TVG and quite well. But he's got some special insights that he actually learned in part from his dad, who I knew when I covered racing in Minneapolis uh, for the Minneapolis Star Tribune. Uh, when Canterbury uh, Downs, now Canterbury Park, uh, opened uh, back uh, many years ago. And the legend, think, Gibson Carruthers, absolutely. Has br brilliant ideas about playing the pick six and somebody who I know has mentored a whole lot of uh, handicappers himself. So Matt certainly got the breeding to offer those excellent insights. And, you know, I don't mean to just run my mouth off and, uh, you know, and, and uh, to hog the microphone. But you do ask a very good question that makes me think, is there really one insight that stands out above the rest? And, you know, I, I, I don't mean to disappoint, but no. Uh, there are insights in every one of those chapters that each of those people, including Rob Henney, uh, who runs a, a private service uh, and is very impressive with the thoughts he has, and uh, Andy Serling, who didn't participate in the same way as others in the book, but made contributions nevertheless. So I think if a player really looked at each of those contributions, they would find one or two ideas individually that they could incorporate in their game. Steve, I want to talk in a little bit more about the new book, Cashing Big on Racing's Biggest Days, which is available in the DRF store as we speak. Folks should go there and pick up a copy. But I want to take, take you way back. I want to take you back to your origins as a horse player before you wrote the landmark book, Betting Thoroughbreds. I want to ask you, as we ask so many guests who come on this show, how did you get into this crazy game in the first place? Well, it's a pretty interesting, wild story, in fact. Uh, I was a baseball prospect of some quality, I must say. Uh, I threw a ball. Uh, I'm a left-handed pitcher, and I could hit also. Uh, I hit two Grand Slam home runs in one game in high school. Right. And at the same time, I, I, I had a, a 75 and 6 record from the Little League all the way through my high school days, and I did seven no-hitters. And I threw the ball almost 90 miles an hour when I was 15 and 16. And truth is, that's nothing today because you get six pitchers on every major league team who throws 92 to 98. But actually, in those days, in the uh, 1960s, when I was in college, uh, you couldn't find two, maybe three pitchers that threw over 90. Uh, Bob Feller in his last years, Allie Reynolds for the Yankees, and you could go to every major league roster and not find anybody else who threw 90 plus. <clears throat> so the scouts were all over me, and I had uh, a chance to sign a really lucrative contract. And something else that's interesting about that, and again, I feel like I'm hogging the microphone. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm loving the story. This is a, a really great story, I think. Uh, <clears throat> Al Campanis, uh, who later was going to unfortunately disgrace himself on Nightline was the leading scout for the Dodgers for many years back then. <clears throat> and he taught me a curve, how to throw a curveball. Uh, that really was amazing. I threw a curveball that broke mostly sideways when he saw me. <clears throat> and he asked me to come out at 5.30 in the morning before he flew back to New York. I was at Dodger Town Camp for Boys. Uh, and I'd say I was 15. <clears throat> and he had me come out there and he he said, hold this bat. And I said, okay. And I held it out. And he says, well, when you throw your curveball, the batter has 30 to 35 inches to hit it because your ball breaks sideways. I'm going to show you a curveball that the batter will only have two and a half inches, the width of the bat, you know, to hit the ball. It broke straight down. And nobody hit me after he taught me that. But anyway, I was, I was ready to sign. And I, I should interrupt. I should interrupt Steve for for listeners who don't know that among Campanus's many claims to fame, isn't he the guy who scouted another lefty, a guy named Sandy Koufax, who people might have heard of? Well, there's a part of the story that involves Sandy at the end of my story, uh, but 
uh, about my baseball and how I got into horse racing. They're linked. In any case, I was on uh, the family summer property <clears throat> in Upper Greenwood Lake, New Jersey. I was out on the motorboat, and all of a sudden it started to pour, and I couldn't get the engine started, no matter how much I pressed the buttons and then pulled and pulled and pulled. Well, I got the boat into uh, into uh, uh, the, the um, dock, and I drove the 45 miles to Bayonne, New Jersey, where I was to pitch that night in a semi-pro amateur game, and I thought it was going to be my last game before I signed. And it turned out to be my last game, because I, when I started to throw, I pulled something in my shoulder, and I linked the fact that I was pulling the cord in the boat, and I strained that. And I was told, don't pick up a ball and throw for a year. Well, I did almost that, but at the same time, I lost about 15 miles an hour in my fastball, and I never could get it back, and I lost my opportunity to play. An umpire who uh, saw me play the outfield and saw me hit a home run, uh, you know, went pretty far, offered me a small minor league contract as a scout to go play <clears throat> for the Milwaukee Braves farm team in uh, the Northwest for $500 where I was going to be getting a lot more money prior to the injury. <clears throat> well, I turned him down. I saw myself in, with a bat in my hand trying to hit me, trying to hit a pitcher like me at my best, and I didn't think I could do it. So I didn't sign, and I went on my way. But going back, the fact that I couldn't pitch when I hurt my arm, <clears throat> friends of mine in college said, Listen, we're going to Fort Lauderdale where the girls are. Why don't you come with us? I said, I only got 40 bucks. I can't do it. They bought me a morning telegraph, which was the Eastern edition of the racing forum, put me on a bus to Aqueduct, and I went there with my 40 bucks, and I hit a daily double for $221 and ran into the parking lot saying, I'm going to Florida, I'm going to Florida, I'm going to Florida. That's fantastic. And Oh. When I got there, I had fun with the girls on the beach like I was supposed to, but I certainly wanted to go back to the track. And I did, and I didn't do too well. Uh, like, you know, it wasn't automatic that I was going to all of a sudden pick winners. But there was something about the game that fascinated me, and I had all this time now on my hands. And so I started studying it, and I started seeing patterns that eventually would wind up in betting thoroughbreds, the first book I wrote. Fantastic. That reminds me, actually, of the story of how Martin Scorsese became a filmmaker. He had an illness as a child and couldn't go out and play with his friends and ended up watching the world from his apartment in Little Italy and hearing the natural sound track and, and seeing what was happening outside and ended up taking those and turning them into stories that became his oeuvre, great movies like Mean Streets. I don't think it's much of an exaggeration to say, Steve, that you've had the impact on handicapping and horse playing in a similar way to what Scorsese's done to film. You're, in, in, the, in this case, uh, these, these injuries that befell you guys have given the, the rest of the world uh, some pretty terrific insights, and for that we, we definitely thank you. Let me ask you this, Steve. Yes. All, the, all the changes that have happened in the game since the time you started following, um, what stands out to you as the number one biggest difference between playing the horses back then and playing the horses in 2016? Well, it's a negative thought, I have to say, and I think the racetracks are responsible for it and are blind, and only Canterbury, strangely enough, a track where I uh, covered for the first eight years of its existence, has come to realize the need to downplay the, the takeout. The takeout is the biggest change in racing, and it's a negative one. 23% in some places higher taken out of your exacta bets and your multiple uh, race bets. That's not fair, and it's hurting them. The, the people who are actually charging that. They're charging too much, and it's making it harder for people to have winning days. And you really have to spend more time as a result of that, learning some of the nuances, because those multi-race wagers and trifectas 
and super effective and even the pick six in some places uh, offer a lot of potential value and are worth shooting at but you're paying a very heavy price to play and it's a terrible event that racing all over the country and in fact in my book I have a listing of all of the tracks at the end of the book with the percentages they take out of every wager unfortunately I went to press a little faster than I wanted to because the old percentages that were attached to Canterbury are still in the uh, appendix section for that uh, but you know when I uh, when I do anything at Canterbury and when I write about it and I did in my current column in gaming today I point out that Canterbury has the right idea lower the takeout give players a chance in fact that lo that new horse player friendly takeout at Canterbury we're talking about 15 percent on win place and show bets 18 percent on exotics the lowest in the country I know a lot of players really impressed with the efforts that Canterbury's put forth they're taking extra care to pay attention to that simulcast signal and I've even heard some contest players talking about making special trips to Canterbury funny enough they actually have a contest to, to win your way into the National Handicapping Championship this weekend if any of our listeners uh, around that area are paying attention you should go there there's a hundred dollar buy-in and two NHC seats on the line and thinking a little bit further out in September they have their annual dog days of summer handicapping contest that's very popular always attracts a lot of shippers think about making Canterbury a park a stop on the tour for all the reasons Steve is talking about it's nice to see people doing things the right way and I think it's smart for we as horse players to uh, to reward them don't you think Steve absolutely and I sure hope you know actually when I covered uh, racing there I was impressed then by the management team that they had there and many of those people are still there and still thinking you know well and uh, well, I mentioned earlier that Matt Carruthers was based there uh, another uh, TVG uh, spokesman was based there and uh, you know it, it uh, it's very clear to me that this is an experiment that ought to be watched by every track executive in the country now I, I have to say while I was highly critical of that and while that is the biggest change in response to your question, the game is still great on so many levels, uh, and there are so many great horses and races that attract me, and I'm, I'm not, not leaving it anytime soon. Uh, I'll fight <laughs> for the lower takeouts for sure, uh, but you know you still can win even with those takeouts in some situations if you use you know really well thought out tools, and that's also uh, I have to say what I tried to put into the book. Let's talk about that a little more. We talk about the effect of takeout. Horse players don't often think about the effective takeout. In other words, if you're betting over a series of races, you're only paying that takeout once, effectively lowering the takeout if you have a genuine opinion across a sequence of races in a bet like the double or the pick three. What are some of the wagering strategies, Steve, that you use to further maximize your value when it comes to multi-race wagers? Well, I, I think that's the, uh, the, the clue of today. Uh, what I focus on, uh, races that are linked to other races where you have some concept of the form of the horses on the surface and the distance that they're traveling that you can build a connected you know, play in and take advantage of the fact that the takeout is only hit at you once. Uh, it's not quite fair to say, a, let's say, a 25% takeout, there are some like that, is reduced uh, into 6% and change uh, basically for each of those races. It comes out a little differently uh, where it's actually closer to 10 or 11% per race for a lot of very subtle mathematical reasons but it's still lower than it would be packing each of those races individually and it is the way that a player should go about their play today given that those linked races uh, are usually on the biggest racing days with good horses in interesting race situations that a player doesn't have to study you know uh, 10 years to, to you know to get to a place where they feel like they have a handle on what they're doing I tend to use two keys uh, and one of the sequences as more prominent than the keys in the others. If I have a single that I really like, I'll certainly accent that in a play like that and build it, build around it. Yet at the same time, 
uh, when even I have a tree that looks solid, I'll take a backup horse in the race. Maybe it'll be a favorite because I've accented the long shot that I like in that situation. It could be the reverse, where uh, I, I really like a favorite to key the sequence, and there's plenty of uh, long shot possibilities uh, with the other races. But in that case, I will uh, you know, take a, a long shot as a backup horse that I had a feeling about. That could be the alternative. And very often I find, if I look at all of my work and look at all of the hits that I've had, that the backup strategy works very effectively. So I laid out about uh, 20 different types of ways to put that together in the chapters that devote themselves uh, to uh, setting up these bets in a way that really works. A lot of our listeners, and we talk on the podcast a lot about DRF Ticketmaker, what you're, you're talking about strategies, they're very similar to what folks might be uh, experienced with if they know Ticketmaker well, but I like some of the extra wrinkles you put on it, Steve, with, of, of grading horses in slightly different ways and putting in slightly different uh, emphases based on the different situations. Do you use the ticket maker program? Is it something that you uh, that that factors into your multi-ticket construction, or do you do it all manually? And what are the benefits of that, if so? Well, I personally rely on me and my strategies to, uh, and I laid them out in the in the book. But I can see the value in using uh, the ticket maker program and maybe even developing a wrinkle or two when I do get more familiar with it. But basically, as you know, to answer your question, uh, I'm my ticket maker, and I have had enough success uh, tinkering with the way that I set up that uh, to believe in it as a way to, for me to go about it. But I can see, without even having used it, that the ticket construction ticket maker that you're talking about uh, could be an asset to save time and could help players who are just getting into the multi-race sequences in a way in which they will be more effective. And I plan to do some experiments with that uh, myself. And I'll probably write a few columns about it as I go forward. I love it. That's a, it's always good to hear. Another critical element of the book, a lot of the different players interviewed talk about Formulator. In fact, our other podcast co-host, Mike Hogan, has a contribution in the appendix with some of the basic sort of a user's guide, if you will, for Formulator. How important is Formulator to your own personal handicapping at this point, Steve? I use it. I like it. I find that it is very creative, a very creative tool. I think you can narrow things down better by using it. Uh, you can be selective about what you want to put into uh, the power of your analysis and therefore lay out tickets that are better, uh, more suited to the circumstance that you've identified. And uh, it's probably the best tool that DRF has ever created to help the horse player. That's <laughs> some high praise. I love it. Folks out there, I think most, most people listening to this show are probably already pretty intimately familiar with it, but, but it's good to have that extra endorsement. And folks out there who are wondering about the benefits of Formulator, uh, listen no further than that endorsement from Steve to know that this is something you want to be checking out. Now I want to go back again in time, Steve, and talk about the days before Formulator and how you learned as a player and some of the tools you had back in the, the, the older days to get you up and running as a horse player. Who, who were the people that you learned from and how did you learn the game of racing once you became serious about it? Well, I have two thoughts on that that are somewhat connected but not, and bear with me. Uh, first, Andy Byer and I became very close friends after we met on a park bench at Saratoga. And while he was not winning at the time and confessed his need to learn things that would help him win, in the following summer, we sat alongside each other through the whole Saratoga meet, and he had his very first winning season as a result of the things that, uh, you know, I guess he learned while I was playing. And at the same time, he was beginning to develop his speed figures, buyer speed figures. And I was trying to encourage him. And as such, I was learning an awful lot about how you could really measure speed. And Andy's buyer speed figures have become a staple. And they were available on a private level for a little while before they became part of uh, publications. And he would write in the Washington Post 
about what he was discovering long before he got into it on a, on a, a critical basis with uh, the Morning Telegraph, the Daily Racing Forum, the Racing Times, and the current uh, uh, Racing Forum. And the other thought that I wanted to share, which is a tail end of the baseball thing, is that I was thinking this while we were going into other areas, and I have to share this. I have a mental trophy in my head about what I did in baseball as a player that never had a chance that will stay with me forever and is a really an amazing mental trophy. Several players that I played with at Rutgers made the minor leagues, and Jeff Torborg made the major leagues. He caught Sandy Koufax's perfect game, and I went to visit uh, Jeff at Philadelphia when he was catching for the Dodgers, and I uh, just wanted to see him after the game. I went down into the players' area with permission, and Andy, I mean, uh, and Jeff introduced me uh, to Walter Austin, who was the long-term manager of the Dodgers at the sure. time. And he, and he said this to Walter, that is my mental trophy. Here's Steve DeVito, which is probably the second best left-handed pitcher I ever caught. <laughs> there's, there's Koufax again. We knew, I knew he'd come back. <laughs> That's fantastic. And to have someone think that about what I did and was there to catch me, like I said, is a mental trophy that I live with and, ca and carry proudly that I had something that I never got a chance to display, but I found horse racing, as we talked before, when my career was essentially over. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, uh, Jeff is still still alive. He married the uh, Miss New Jersey of the time, and he's a happy man, and I'm very glad to have known him. A lot of people listening, we have a lot of Mets fans who listen to the podcast. They rem might remember Jeff uh, a little bit on the infamous side. He was the, the manager of that worst exactly. team money could buy, whatever it was, the 92 or 93 <laughs> Mets. Did you ever talk to him during that era? How did, how did his New York experience wear on him? Well, it wore on him. And uh, he was a manager of three other teams. And, you know, he didn't last very long uh, with any of them. Cleveland, uh, he did well. Chicago. Uh, White Sox, he did well. The Mets right now, which um, I'm kind of a fan still, they can't hit. They need <laughs> batters. The, in the, the injuries play. right now are making them a little difficult to watch. That was, that was a little rough yeah, for folks who watched that day game yesterday. That was a, that was a little rough uh, watching them not get more than one run behind DeGrom, that's for sure. But I want to ask you a I baseball agree. handicapping question, Steve. Did you ever try to apply any of the lessons from horse racing and handicapping to baseball? I know you've spent plenty of time in Las Vegas. Have you ever tried seriously to, to bet baseball, and what do you think of that as a, as a pastime? I have never made a bet on a baseball game in my life. And Interesting. I, I do feel sometimes that I could or should, but uh, I'm a fan of the sport on a, uh, on a level that uh, I guess, uh, you know, uh, is pure, <laughs> and, and while the opportunities abound in front of me everywhere I go, horse racing is enough of a challenge and enough of a jigsaw puzzle to play properly that you know I I don't need another uh, outlet for it, and horse racing is still doing okay by me. <laughs> if you were talking to a, a younger person who is interested in devoting a serious amount of their time and potentially investment capital into playing the horses these days. What would be the number one piece of advice you would give that person? It's a very good question. It really is. And uh, it's happened to where I've been in that situation. And what I tried to do before I gave my advice was to find out if I could in an interview or a conversation with a player who wanted to learn what kind of basic skill do they have? Are they good uh, observers? Uh, are they good mathematically? Uh, are they, uh, what is it that they could bring to the table? And for those people that seem to me to have good observation powers, I tell them to go watch replays a lot. I tell them to try and see things that happen in a race that might stand out or might show that the horse had more ability than his result chart or PP best performances would show. If a person, and when a person has that skill, that basic skill, it's amazing and powerful how a person can build a tremendous game 
focusing on the way races are run, who ran in them, how the races were run, and where they were running on what surface and take notes, and they'll be shocked. The player will be shocked. And I've had people come back to me after I started them in that direction and show me that they have really gained a foothold on a winning approach. Uh, it still takes time. It's still You can't disappear from it you know, for several months and expect everything to click. Uh, it's something that requires your attention. But if you're a good observer and you like doing that, it's a fantastic way to get into the game. If you're mathematically inclined and you have the ability to put numbers together that make sense, that you can see the takeout and its effect, you can look at what you talked about earlier, where you can get four races together and minimize the takeout for each race if you have a solid opinion in each of those races. Because sometimes if you have to buy six horses in one of those races because you don't have a square opinion, the takeout comes back to haunt you in a different way. That was what I was hinting at earlier. That's more complicated. Sure. But nevertheless, if you have mathematical inclinations and you feel good about doing that kind of stuff, I tell them, go in that direction. Study the odds board. Look at the potential payoffs in different exact and uh, other possible combinations that are, that are posted. Predict what you think the payoff should be in a three race or four race sequence that was just run and see exactly what the payoff is. How close were you? And those are the types of things that a player from that direction can also build a solid game. There are other ways to do it. Uh, I found myself focusing more on the patterns that trainers presented me when I could identify them. Uh, that's sort of a, a different thing from math and or uh, watching races or horses. It's learning patterns and seeing patterns. And some people have that kind of inclination, too. And I, I usually won't mention it in a first-level conversation to a player who wants to improve. But I'll find that in conversation with such a player on the second or third time, they're seeing that or starting to see that. And boy, that's a terrific direction to go in. Trainer patterns is one of the things that you talked about in the original betting thoroughbreds, some other concepts that they're so familiar now, some people listening won't even realize that these were revolutionary ideas when that book came out, talking about key races, talking about track biases. How have those three factors specifically evolved for you over time? It sounds like the trainer patterns are just as important to the work you're doing today, Steve, as they were back in the time of the original betting thoroughbreds. What about key races and track biases? Are they still important to the work you do, figuring out who's going to win a given horse race? Well, you're right about the trainer patterns existing today even more powerfully, I think, than when I first was getting involved in them, because there's more information about the trainer that you can research and apply. And you're hinting correctly that track bias is not as big a factor. In fact, it's only occasionally when you see a real track bias come into the play and the impact when it is there is to eliminate most of the field in given races because they don't have the running style that's being favored uh, by the bias or they don't have the post position that's favored by the bias. And it's rare enough that when you encounter it, it's a money-making uh, you know, field that you have to explore once you see it. So I tell people, and I do myself, keep an eye out for them. But there may only be 10 times a year instead of a whole race meet or half a race meet where a bias has influenced the performances of so many horses. But when it comes into play, every race that was run, when there was an inside speed bias or there was a closers bias or whatever the bias really was, uh, it's rare, but when it's there, it's powerful. Uh, as far as key races are concerned, that's still a very good factor to learn how to identify and use. It doesn't happen maybe as often as it did when the schedules of races were not uh, 12 months a year at most tracks every day uh, and or five days a week for 12 months. They had seasons, like some tracks still do. Uh, Del Mar, Saratoga, uh, you know, a few others. But when you look at Gulfstream, for instance, Gulfstream used to have a winter meet, and that was it. Then Calder would take over during the summer, and that winter meet was strong, as strong as uh, you know, for key races, uh, as uh, Saratoga and Del Mar still are. Uh, and you get some of them in Churchill Downs, and you get some of them at Belmont, 
but they're not as frequent, yet they're just as powerful when you encounter them. A key race is when horses in the race come out of that race and perform above expectations in their next start. Five or six horses out of that race, something like that. One thing, I like how you actually subtly altered the definition there, Steve, from the way you describe it in betting thoroughbreds. In betting thoroughbreds, you talk about multiple horses coming back from a race and winning, but I think that's a really important thing to pay attention to, especially in the formulator era, that it could just be horses coming back and outperforming expectations. With formulator, especially in the charts view, where you can look at all the buyer speed figures, you can see, let's say, several horses just come back and improve their buyer speed figure points by, say, 8 or 10, even if they don't necessarily win, you could still consider that a, a key race, you think, in the modern day? Absolutely, but you have to be careful. You know, you need a few horses to most of the horses in a race that come back out and outperform what you might have expected them to do or their history of buyer speed figures or whatever the yardstick they seem to be improving on in their next starts. You can't just look at it when you see the second and fourth place finisher in that race doing well. You say, oh, that's a key race. It's a good race. It's a race right. where there was some competition. And they're not to be discounted, the horses that ran in those races and ran well, especially if they do improve next out. But uh, a key race to me, and to have the real power of the, of the concept, is a race where five or six horses outperform their expectations based on their histories and they came out of a singular race, and you have to now watch the horses that are yet to race back, and or these horses coming back for another race. Do they still race at the new level that they established in their follow-up race or not? It's a subtle concept, but I try to keep track of them uh, as religiously as I can. There's also a fun tool within DRF Plus that you might not have even seen, Steve, that, that uh, DRF Plus subscribers have access to where we'll issue a key race report on a given day and sort of track the races where horses have come back to run significantly better. The key race report might focus only on winners. You might need to use Formulator to expand it to looking at improved speed figures. But if folks are interested in the key race concept, if you don't already have betting thoroughbreds, what are you waiting for? Get a copy of that book. You can read the, the sort of original treatise on it and then uh, and try to apply it to your own work and check out the key race report on DRF Plus for a little bit of further info. One topic, Steve, I want to talk to you about is the role that speed figures play in handicapping in 2016. For me, there's still my way of looking at the world. There are lens through which I digest all the information in a race, trying to see who has run the fastest in a final time way and comparing them to all the other runners and to what that class level usually runs. That said, as primary as they are in my handicapping, as important as they are, I do believe it's never been tougher to make money just with betting a speed figure and that we need all these additional concepts like some of the ones we've been talking about in order to take those speed figure horses and filter them and make bets on them profitable. Do you agree with my view of where we're at with speed figures in 2016, and how do you use them in your handicapping in the present day? I agree somewhat, but I, I'll, I'll share what I, what I do with uh, speed figures and where I feel they are most effective still. Uh, there are two categories of races where I'm especially impressed by a speed figure number that uh, you know was earned in the either of these two categories of races. And one is sprint racing. Uh, and I find that you know, you'll get higher numbers typically for the best horses that do run in sprint stakes. Uh, and they're effective. Uh, they mean uh, what the numbers say in most cases. And, the, uh, and so a horse who runs fast and gets a fast number in a sprint race, and he's now running in another sprint uh, that number is pretty reliable, I think, to measure who he is. There could be interfering negative factors, like the trainer was absent for a month and a half and his assistant didn't follow the same pattern that he previously did, uh, or uh, there is a, a medical issue that came up and he's now getting, you know, Lasix. Well, almost every horse gets Lasix now, but it used to be more discriminatory when horses got it. But there are minor uh, little tinkling, tink, uh, 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 tinkers that I make with the speed figures, and I trust them a lot in, in sprint races, especially high-grade sprint races. 
and also uh, and turf. Uh, turf is different how I use them, but they are powerful. Uh, horses who belong in the graded stakes companies of races that I follow on the grass, and this is aside from maidens who you know are, are just going to graduate on the grass and prove that they may be grass horses that could uh, move up in class or what have you. I'm talking about the regular graded stakes competition on the grass in most of the regions of the country. We have grass racing. And I think 100 plus uh, makes sense as far as a horse deserving to be in those graded stakes levels. And that comparisons between horses uh, and uh, who come out of similar races, uh, even a one or two point difference in their numbers, if they were earned you know, without a gift, you know, like uh, a lonely lead where nobody gave the horse any pressure at all, and you know, he just ran on his own, and there was no no challenge. Uh, I don't pay much attention to those numbers on the grass, but at the same time, I use them really as a basic number one handicapping issue factor. Uh, for my grass handicapping, and it's surprising even to me how effective that can be. There are other issues, of course. Uh, you're not throwing out the whole arsenal of things you need to pay attention to, but in grass racing, uh, higher grade grass racing, and in sprints uh, that involve good horses, I find the speed figures to be powerful. I have a follow-up question about turf handicapping, especially in an event like the Breeders' Cup. What kind of tools do you use to evaluate the horses shipping in from Europe and the United Kingdom when it comes to the Breeders' Cup? Well, uh, I'm a little more selective about the Europeans coming in for a Breeders' Cup race to try and beat our horses, if you will. Uh, I want to see that they competed in the very best races in Europe and did well that I recognize the names of some of those horses. And, of course, if video is available, I'll definitely go to that. And that's one of the key things I use in my uh, turf handicapping of high-class races. I want to see I want to see races that they competed in. I want to see the energy that I think they're expending uh, past the wire or how much they will use artificially, perhaps, in the early stages of a race that might have compromised the actual finishing punch. I use video a lot, and I use video in almost every uh, major turf race that I can get my hands on the video that applies to whatever performance that did, whether they came from Europe or they're based in the U.S. or Canada. Getting the tapes from Europe is not easy, and I wish they were more uh, readily available, and it's going to be a column that I'm going to write at some point during the summer uh, to emphasize the need for us to import those races and, and tape in a way that players can really look at them. A lot of those major races these days you can find on YouTube, but yeah, there are some gaps, and it would be great if, it, if international uh, racing politics made it so that th those were even more available than they already are. What, what, what advice would you give to somebody with, with the lack of as much data on those races? Yes. We're finally starting to see some sectional time information coming in at some of the biggest race meetings in the UK and Ireland. But a lot of times when you're doing that visual handicapping on those races, Steve, you're, you're kind of going, I assume, more by feel than by any hard data. What advice would you give someone like me who'd love to get better at just being able to watch the video of a race and to draw any meaningful conclusion that I'd be willing to risk a dollar on? Well, I, I shared a little bit of that in the previous answer uh, when I said that, you know, when you watch horses break from the gate, are they being used to get to, uh, get there in front or in a contending position? And does it hurt them in the end or does it not hurt them? If it does not hurt them, you're looking at a horse that has more ability than maybe the PP line shows because he not only was used early to get a position, but he held himself well through the race. and. Uh, was competitive. That's a horse that you should think of as having more natural ability than maybe a past performance line suggests. And the way horses finish uh, is also, you know, of course, important. But I look for mostly the type of situation that happens when a horse is starting his rally, and I'm watching these races, and I see him blocked or having to steady for a couple of strides. 
and he regathers himself and fires a good rally anyway. That horse earns a little extra credit for me in what I'm watching and what I'm looking for. And it's those types of things that you as a player have to develop uh, as you watch races to see the meaningfulness of certain uh, you know, performance uh, you know, indicators. And I've found that if I find those indicators, like just the two I just mentioned, uh, and I apply them to the horse in a race that's running today, I can give them that, an extra point or two. I can look at the way the race is going to be run today and see if the stretch runner who is blocked is going to have an advantage because there's a lot of pace in the race. And or the reverse, if he's a horse that breaks well and gets a contending position and stays most of the race even after being used early, maybe this race lacks that kind of competition for the first three-eighths of a mile. I'll give that horse extra credit. Those are the kinds of things that I, I would suggest. It sounds like the kind of thing that you're just going to learn it by doing it. There's no real primer. There's a lot of common sense and just accrued knowledge from watching a lot of races uh, here and over there, and eventually you'll be able to, to make the kinds of assessments you're talking about. Does that sound about right, Steve? It does, but at the same time, I don't find that it's as laborious as that sounds. I find <laughs> it interesting. I find it intriguing when I can see something extra that's not in the PP line necessarily. It might uh, I draw a little comment at the back line of a past performance, uh, you know, blocked and uh, re-rallied. You know, is well, go look at that tape. You know, uh, when you see that kind of a comment. But I find it fascinating and interesting to get into these races visually. And here, it's very important to make this point. Not everybody is going to want to play the horses well. They think they will, but they have to demonstrate it by actually getting involved in the races in the manner that I'm talking about. Looking at it from a visual standpoint, studying the impact of certain fire speed figures in certain types of races, looking at the pattern of the way races are run and which type of races favor which type of running styles. Uh, mathematically looking at the odds board in a way that you can, you know, calculate an advantage because you like this horse or that horse in the sequence. Uh, you can minimize the takeout because you don't have to buy six or seven horses in that race. Uh, these are things that come up as you're trying to get better. These are the things that you can get better at. And these are the things that if you like them, you're on your way to learning more than the guy sitting next to you who really is bored or, uh, or doesn't feel inclined to put in a little extra work. It's definitely a game that rewards the hard work. I didn't even realize I was making watching races sound tedious. Personally, I love it. It's a lot of fun that, uh, trying to get a line on the form of those shippers for the Breeders' Cup or just watching replays day in, day out. I, how important is it to have passion for the game to be able to do all the hard work that needs to be done? Well, it's, it's key. I mean, when I was starting out, I ran into the parking lot. I'm going to Florida, going to Florida. And I lost several hundred dollars of my own money when I got back because I didn't have a clue. <laughs> but, at the same, but at the same time, there was a fascinating element to it. Uh, I found it more interesting than watching humans run the 100-yard dash uh, or a mile even, although every once in a while when the, uh, the Roger Bannisters of that era would approach four minutes, uh, it was intriguing TV to follow that, but there were so many things, and, and I got very lucky early in my career uh, when I saw Majestic Prince and uh, I saw, uh, you know, horses who were coming to, to the fore uh, in the Triple Crown races that impressed me, and not too many years afterwards while I was in the game, I saw Reva Ridge and then Secretariat in Seattle <laughs> Blue and Affirmed and Ali Dar. And those horses were incredible athletes. When you saw what a horse is when he's an athlete, what he can do, how impressive he can be. And, uh, you know, it just brought me into the game deeper. Where did the idea for betting thoroughbreds come from? I assume that the, the Tom Ainsley book would have been the gold standard at the time of, of publication. Was it your idea? Did somebody come to you with the idea for betting thoroughbreds and, and – uh, Talk about how that came to be a little bit. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I love Andy Byer. We're great friends. But he wrote a book uh, based on the ideas that I was teaching him. And 
he wrote a book that uh, picking winners that was a very good book and Andy's a tremendous writer I mean he was a columnist for all three newspapers in Washington and wound up with the Washington Post a, a gold standard uh, you know of, of uh, writing and commentary and he wrote picking winners and in the book were several of the ideas I had taught him that turned his game around and when I saw that and said to him you know I probably should write a book I made contact with an agent and I didn't have five minutes to convince him he said yes absolutely uh, I think I can get I think I can get a publisher for you and uh, we got one and it was E.P. Dutton which was a pretty good publisher at the time and uh, I was off and running that's great that's great and all these years later still in print still extremely relevant one of the books I recommend to people today before I let you go Steve another topic I want to cover is handicapping contests I see them of course as uh, as anyone who knows me knows as this terrific frontier a great way for players to learn and to get involved and this positive influence on horse playing in general just curious to get your take on handicapping contests in general I like them I played in them uh, about seven eight years ago and made the final groupings and won some money I didn't win a lot of money but you know I felt like I had the ability to do well in them but uh, I was uh, over overly occupied by a lot of personal details uh, I was uh, going through a divorce I was getting a settlement of taking care of my son actually the proper way is is that we took care of each other uh, my <laughs> son went and and we learned a lot from each other truthfully uh, as a dad and a son and he's got a wonderful life himself now he still lives in Minneapolis he's got two kids of his own that's a single parent now I mean this is happening all over the country where divorcing is more possible probable than long-term marriages and I envy those people who have that and going for them but Brad's a good guy and uh, we learned from each other and I had a lot going on and then I uh, I moved uh, out here to Vegas and I needed to get established and the, the number of jobs in the newspaper world was diminished down to almost zero we had 60 racing columnists at one point in my lifetime uh, who were full hired uh, I don't think we have one I don't think we have one it was a full-time racing columnist who was hired by a newspaper and not just freelance contract like the one I have with the weekly here in Nevada uh, gaming today glad to be working for them and glad to be putting in columns with very little uh, you know uh, guidance from above I can write what I want to write uh, and at the same time, uh, if you go to the Los Angeles market or the New York market or the Washington market, there are no full-time columnists anymore. But I, I, I got my forum, and I spent a lot of time building it. And I might want to go back to playing some contests in the next year or so because I did like them, and I think they're great for racing. And there's a lot of money there to be won. That's right. We've seen that at the NHC with the first prize this year going to a professional horse player, Paul Matisse, taking home a cool 800000 plus the extra 10000 he won by, by placing a win bet on himself in the race book mm -hmm. there at Treasure Island. It's sort of, sort of a great, uh, great story as well. I love that. Well, yeah, it's pretty. I, what happens is they give you part of your gift for playing in the NHC. They give you a chip that you can bet anywhere. He figured, what better to do with this chip that I've been given than to bet it on myself? And that's what he went ahead and did. Pretty great, pretty great story. Have you ever had the pleasure of meeting Paul Matisse? You'd get along. I, I don't think so, but I can't say that it didn't happen for sure because, you know, when you're rotating and doing seminars as I do, uh, several for the, uh, uh, for the uh, Sunset Station, uh, I did one for the win. Uh, you might meet somebody in a handshake and not really register who they are. Uh, and if the opportunity comes up, I will miss it next time because That's I respect great. what he's doing. Absolutely. And he's a figure maker himself and somebody who I can pretty much guarantee as part of his teeth cutting process read, uh, read your work. Steve, for folks who are interested today, what's the best way for them to find your columns? Well, GamingToday.com is where they'll find my columns under the columnist list. It's a weekly publication, and uh, it's been in existence in Vegas, I understand, for almost 40 years. And I'm proud and pleased to be writing a weekly column for them. It comes out 
uh, Tuesdays. I write it Sunday night, and it comes out Tuesdays. And I'll be doing that uh, for a while, uh, as far as I can see, going forward. Uh, right. In fact, the current column uh, mentioned the Belmont, of course, to some extent, but too early to get into that. And I devoted about a third of it to the takeout situation and Canterbury's experiment urging as many track managers to look at what they're doing and try to think of ways to do something similar. I, I love it. I, I support it. That's fantastic. The book is Cashing Big on Racing's Biggest Days. It's available now in the DRF store. If there are any book signings or anything like that, we will help, uh, we'll announce things on the podcast. And Steve, perhaps you'll be willing at some future day to come back on and handicap a few races with us on the show? Absolutely. And I, I appreciate the forum that you have. And uh, keep it going and keep uh, bringing uh, new people in uh, to discuss new ideas. And I thank you for the support that you're giving uh, Cashing Big on Racing's Biggest Days. Uh, I'm very happy it's out in print now, and uh, I'm proud of it. Uh, you should be. It's a really cool book. Folks should check that out. If you don't already have a copy of Betting Thoroughbreds, put that on your list as well, whether you're reading it to sort of refresh on some of those ideas or it's new material to you. It's going to help you improve and grow as a horse player. I want to thank Steve Davidowitz for joining us here today on the DRF Players Pod. I want to thank Mike Hogan and Jonathan Kitchen. They're not here today, no, but I always like to give credit to the usual crew, and they'll be back with me hopefully for a show next week. I want to thank Charlie Zeggers for all of his excellent production help. And most of all, I want to thank all of you for listening. We'll be back next week. And when you're playing the horses this weekend, I hope you win all your photos. <laughs>